Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance from God, our loving Father, and Jesus, our living Redeemer and Savior, who is described in the Gospel reading in his entry to Jerusalem these words. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. These are words of our Lord. Dearly loved people of God, gathered by him in his rich mercy, here at the beginning of a new church year, we fondly bid farewell to the gospel according to St. Matthew to embrace and hold fast the Holy Spirit's voice largely through the pen of St. Mark in the year to come. There will be some other sprinklings from the other gospels, but mostly St. Mark. And on this first glimpse, the first Sunday of Advent, we boldly open Mark's gospel where he shows us Jesus being welcomed as he should be as king. So, I would like for you to think about how earthly kings arrive with proper pomp and ceremony with all the high dignitaries and attendants. Huge preparations are made in advance of an earthly king coming. And stories are written about kings who secretively come cloaked in humility and bring surprise, makes for good storytelling. But Jesus is different than any earthly king. Huge preparations are made in advance for earthly kings, tons of preparations. Two times in my life I've had the privilege to be among the crowd when a sitting president of the United States of America has been present. You can't help noticing the great attention given to security, especially these days. You can't help noticing the appearances of everything that's happening. The appearances of everything in the backdrop of what might be a photo or a video that gets flashed around the world or preserved for posterity. On one of those occasions, we were in a position where we could see the Secret Service men before the president's arrival tearing off strips of tape and taping the flags so that what looked like a, a gracefully draped flag was actually taped in place so that it looked graceful, even though it didn't seem to want to hang the way they liked it. Yeah, interesting. Everything, it seems, was scripted. Jesus' approach and entry into Jerusalem was scripted by the Holy Spirit, who through Zechariah the prophet had written hundreds of years prior, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus, on the other hand, never conducted himself like an earthly king. He never commanded people to bow before him, nor did his disciples lead the way saying that. He seemed to get out of the way to be out of the limelight, doing loving deeds in humility, like a servant, helping people, teaching the good news of God's coming rule, but never sounding the trumpet to get attention. But there was just one day that was different, quite different. A day when he entered Jerusalem with fanfare. His really was the entry of a king. Jesus had taken great care to enter in the manner that the Holy Spirit in the scriptures had scripted ahead of time, hundreds of years, probably 500 years in advance. And to him, the excited crowd shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus' arrival? Quite different than an earthly king, though. Does he ride upon a royal steed? No. And are there heralds, trumpeters? Doo, 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 make way for the king. Nope. How about a vanguard of highly trained troops? Nope. Instead, we find Jesus riding upon a colt. Turns out it's the colt's inaugural ride, fitting for Jesus. He, the Lord, had need of it, so his instructions to his disciples were to bring it as commanded. 
It's interesting when the disciples go and they, they get confronted by untying this colt. What are you doing untying the colt? I double checked with Matthew and with Mark and with Luke and with each of the gospels. It literally should be translated, but it would seem awkward. Its Lord has need of it. Like this colt has a Lord and that Lord, Jesus now has a timely need of it. So they just say, the Lord has need of it. But it's, it's interesting because it takes us back to another welcome song of Jesus, Psalm 24, that begins, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The sea, those that fill it. Oh yeah, donkeys and colts too. And you and me, the Lord's. The Lord has need of it. Jesus' mode of transport and his entry fulfills the words of the prophet Zechariah. He is indeed a king, but a different kind of king. Oh, what kind of king might he be? Jesus received a royal welcome from the people. They had great hope. Political hopes, oh yeah, freedom from the hated Romans. This guy's going to do it. Woohoo! Their spiritual hopes were also stirred, though, because it was inseparable, those two, for the Jewish people of that day. Almost inseparable. Hosanna, Lord, save. Ooh, from who? From these Romans? Hmm, now we're getting political. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Again, quoting from the Psalms. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. There's those earthly hopes coming through. Hosanna in the highest. Messianic hopes, or hopes for the Messiah, the Anointed One, ran high, for he would surely reestablish the glory days of the Davidic kingdom, which had been absent nearly 600 years at this point. But there had always been a promise of its return, and when it returned, it would be forever. Jesus was the Messiah, all right, but not the kind of Messiah they were expecting. He'd come to deliver his people, all right, and to deliver them from something far more insidious than Roman rule, from their sins. He'd come, the only one who could do this, he'd come to bear the sins of all mankind and to shed the, the only blood that could possibly atone for all our sins, his own innocent Son of God and Son of Man blood. And while the crowd and the followers all have visions of immediate glory bursting in upon them, Jesus' eyes must be looking ahead in the week. He's already wept about this. When this moment will seem like a mirage, as he's betrayed, innocently condemned, scourged, and led away to execution. For it is through this fulfillment of yet other prophetic words that he will accomplish his mission fully. And as he dies later, that Passover Friday, bearing the sins of all, he will truly bring about that for which the full glory of the eternal Father rested upon him. He will have reconciled the world to God. As John, his apostle, who was there to the end at the foot of the cross, would write later, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. You, me, reconciled to God. It's a done deal. You can add nothing to what he's done. What is left for us is to praise him for what he's done and to welcome him into our lives more fully. So... We who have the benefit of hindsight might ask, does Jesus receive a royal welcome from us? Most of us know fitting ways to welcome. Um, do we rise in the presence of an elder or a senior? Does our speaking reflect welcome, dignity, honor? Would we ever insult or disgrace the name of a valued or honored guest such as Jesus? Surely not, right? And regarding external matters, we can certainly understand certain preparations would be appropriate. We might clean or put out special towels or put away the pile of mail or shake out and reposition the welcome mat. But wait, this king who knows our thoughts and our words before we speak them and our minds 
shouldn't we also be preparing internally? Mm. Isn't there some inner house cleaning needed? And what is it you've got that needs to go? It's a good thought for us to carry with us into this Advent season. Surely this great king who knows you and me through and through, and he still loves you and me, will not be satisfied with mere outward preparations. Have you got worries? Anger? Bitterness? Lust? Envy? Pride? Greed? Gluttony? Sloth? God's answer? Don't just be ashamed of it. Return. Repent. Turn away from it. Confess it. You know those words we say so often. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, boom, forgiveness. And not just for some most, but for all our sins. Confessing leads us with the Holy Spirit's aid on a new path. The Holy Spirit has called each and every one of you. Me too. And the call of the king is to believe and to live and to walk the life of the baptized, dying to sin, rising in the new life that Christ gives us daily. He is a great king. He's not to be trifled with. Repentance, preparation, an Advent theme, which is the reason why we delete those alleluias in Advent. It's not that alleluias are bad. No, they're great. But we delete them in public worship as a reminder, hmm, there are seasons that demand preparation, and this is certainly big among them. And I should remind you at this point that uh, sometime in most of our lives, a change took place into when we use this reading. Because this used to be what we would say Palm Sunday, and it was the Sunday leading into Holy Week. And I guarantee if you took everything that I've just said about this this occasion today, it would seem really out of place at the beginning of Holy Week, probably, as we are thinking about celebrating our Lord's birth and those things coming before us. But that's exactly why our Lord came. In our lifetimes, when a new lectionary was produced about 2005 or thereabouts, um, this reading was lifted out of there and put here for a very special purpose, to keep us mindful of these things in this season of the year, because that week, Holy Week, that Sunday is now called the Sunday of the Passion. And it draws our attention more to what's going to happen in Holy Week than I can give you here. But preparation, an Advent theme, is always appropriate in welcoming our King. And repentance is none other than a retrospective introspective look within by which we turn from everything that displeases God and falls short of his high calling upon us. And we embrace that new life daily as we follow. So Jesus' entry into our lives, how does he want to enter into our lives? Well, we have many opportunities to welcome him. There are devotional moments, day in and day out, by which we invite his word into our hearts and minds and lives where the Holy Spirit can continue to work his fashioning work on us, his miracle of faith. And then there are those regular worshipful moments, and thanks be to God, you've remembered today to be here and made extra effort to be here so that you're hearing God's word, word that can touch our hearts unto eternity. What a rich blessing. And these words, like God's word, like a buffet table, offer us all kinds of an array of goodies, always pointing to the Son of God, who has come into the world to save sinners like you and me. And then there's this strengthening meal, fortifying us on our homeward pilgrim journey. When Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, those crowds shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Does Jesus receive a royal welcome from you? I pray these words would be true for you as well as me. And they'll be sung during communion. I hope we get that far in our hymns. Redeemer, come and open wide my heart to thee. Here, Lord, abide. O enter with thy grace divine, thy face of mercy on us shine. Thy Holy Spirit guide us on until our glorious goal is won. Eternal praise and fame we offer to thy name. 
Now may God's rich peace guard and preserve your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.